have your Bibles, open them to uh, Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. I'm in a series called Lost and Found, and the chapter uh, in God's Word that uh, deals with that is Luke 15. Uh, Jesus was there, and um, there was a group of people that came around him uh, described as uh, sinners. I guess I would be a part of that. And uh, to that, there was another group there that were religious folk, and they uh, did not like it that Jesus with, was with the sinners. And I pray that's not the group that I am a part of. I don't want to be a part of the group that looks down upon others. I don't want to be a part of the group that, that thinks themselves better than others. I don't want to be a part of the group that thinks that they've got it and others need it. I want to always understand that I have what I have by the grace of God. Not any good work that I've done. Not, not, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. And I'm going to go to heaven as being a sinner saved by grace. I haven't received a, a plateau where I've uh, gotten so holy that, that I, I don't still need the, the gracious hand of God every day, every day, every moment of every day. When I think of um, this table that is in front of us that we'll take part of in a minute, it represents the, the life of the blood of Christ that was given so that we could have life, the body that was broken so that we could be made whole. I, I am very grateful, very, very, very grateful for the work of Christ. And I don't want to ever take that for granted. But yet, we fall into a place as Christians where we don't see the need of salvation. Maybe because we've accepted Christ, many of us accepted Christ at a very young age, and I think that's a great thing. I don't want one person to be lost one day longer than they have to be. I wish every one of our children, when they reached the age where they knew that they were responsible for their sins before a holy God, I, I would pray that they would to repent of their sins as quickly and walk into that relationship with God and let God do for them what only He could do. I heard a preacher not too long ago when he was talking about sinners, he said, the druggard, the drunkard, the one down and out. And I realized when I heard those words that sometimes in our mind's eye, we look at a certain segment of people and we say, now those folks are lost. And I'm one of those people that know a lot of people that have been on drugs. I'm one of those people that know a lot of people who really battle alcohol. I know a lot of people that still have hang-ups and issues. I know a lot of people that, that uh, hadn't got it all together yet. And yet, I know a lot of people that have businesses that are far from God. I know bankers. I know attorneys that are far from God. I know people in finance and in sales, school teachers, people, uh, mayors, people on town councils who are far from God. I know, I know neighbors that keep the nicest of yards that, that will help when a tree falls in your yard and they will come to, to help out. I know people who will fix flat tires or if your wife is on the side of the road with the hood up, will stop and help and, and do it kindly and sincerely and, and do it with no threats, but they're far from God. There are people that we work with and work for that are far from God. We talk about the world, and, and we talk about how bad the world is, and yet we 
we talk about it as if it's out there, far from us. We talk about who's your one, just one. Do we know someone who's far from God that we could invite to church on September 15th? And yet, when, we, we, when I say that statement to us, to us, we think, now who in the world could I invite? I don't know. The longer you're a Christian, we're told, the less you're around or you associate with people that are far from God. I, I, I disagree with that. It's just we, we don't invite those people. We, we, we stay close to the ones that are Christian. We hang out with the ones we go to church with. We invite them over for supper and we'll visit them in the hospital. We'll do random acts of kindness for them. But that doesn't mean that we're not surrounded by people that we know who don't know what we do inside these walls, who are still hurting. When Jesus was with this crowd, he was attracted to them. They were attracted to him, and he was attracted to them. And everyone in society knew they was, those, those were the ones that they didn't want to deal with. It didn't mean just the drunkards. The tax collectors were rich. When it said sinners, it could have been those, those businessmen who cheated. It may have been those who just took advantage of others. It could have been those who just didn't seem to care. But the religious people had no time for them. So he spoke three parables. Last week we talked about the the 100 sheep, and Jesus, the great shepherd. He, he, his great privilege is to take care of us. But if one, because of their own recklessness, gets away, if one finds himself stranded and alone and lost, he doesn't just say, well, I got to take care of my 99. They should have never wandered away. At least I've got my 90 and 9. Jesus says the good shepherd leaves the 90 and 9 and goes after the one until he finds it. And we're supposed to be Christ in this world. We're supposed to be under shepherds like he, the great shepherd, loves us. And today we look at the woman who we know is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. Stand with me, if you would, in honor of reading God's Word. Luke chapter 15, verse number 8. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over, say the word, one sinner who repents. Praise God for the value in one. Praise God that the one is not overlooked. Praise God that, that, that the one saw enough importance to search until the one is found. So let me ask you, church, once again, who's your one? Who's your one? Let's pray. My Lord, my God, my Savior, my Master, my King, my friend, 
who undergirds me, who loves me, who prays for me each day. Lord, I find great, great, great value in you. You are so beautiful. And I thank you for the love of which you love me. And I thank you for the Holy Spirit and the work that the Holy Spirit does. Seeking and searching. Speaking to hearts. Loving. Fulfilling your mission. Father, may the Spirit of God work in us so that the work of God may be done. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Last week, when Jesus speaking about the hundred sheep, he said, what man of you? Now today he says, what woman? He's saying, would there be any woman who would not do this? It says that um, she had ten silver coins and she lost one. A lot of the scholars, when they look at this scripture, they just simply say, that's the drachma, that's the, the coin of the day, has the uh, emblem of the, uh, of the emperor on it. And they do a lot of exegetical uh, gymnastics to, to, can I just say, Warren Wearsby freed me up. I was reading Warren Wearsby's take on this, and he had a, a very different viewpoint that just lit my heart up. It made it come to life for me. In that day, when a young woman got married, she would receive a headband to wear that would have 10 silver coins on it. When Lynn and I got married, we exchanged rings. When we got engaged, I gave her a diamond. Can I tell that story? <laughs> I uh, was seeing Lynn that night and had it stuck away, you know, wanted it to be a special night. And it didn't go exactly the way I was hoping it would at the beginning. So uh, she made me wait. And y'all know my spiritual gift is being a wisecrack or a practical joker or sarcasm. So when I gave her the ring, she, her eyes got big and she smiled real big. And I said, yes, Lynn, it's this new kind of ring out there. It's supposed to be really wonderful. It's called a, and I mispronounced it on purpose, cubic zirconum. <laughs> and then her eyes got really big. And I let her believe it for a little bit, and then I said, no, it's real. She didn't believe me. I had to go out to the car and get the certificate of authentication. It's real, baby, I promise, it's real. It's real. When I got her, Lynn has a small hand, and um, when I had it sized, I had to get it sized down to ladies, y'all can gasp, a two and a half. She had a small finger. And I got her a whole carrot. Barely a whole carrot. But I got her a whole carrot. Now, I said all that to say this. If Lynn's diamond fell out, y'all with me? There would be panic. Amen. And I could buy her another diamond, but that wouldn't do. I could get her a two-carat diamond or a five-carat diamond. Well, I may not. Maybe she wants a five-carat. I don't know. <laughs> She's doing this. You know, I get in a lot of trouble when I preach. But if you lost the diamond, the search would be on. Amen. Amen. Because it's precious, and it matters. And for this woman who had the, the, the necklace of ten coins to lose one, it, it would stick out, and it would, it would be a, a loss of something very valuable to her. 
This, that, that was really, uh, according to Warren Wearsby, and I've done some other search on it, uh, that, that would be the, the, the engagement ring or the, or the wedding band of the day. And when she went into public, she would wear that. So when, when she, she, she found her, her thing and, and has the ten coins on it, but finds one of them is gone, she begins the search. And it probably began, began kind of eagerly, but as it goes on, it becomes a frantic search. So in the, the houses in the day would be dark, and, and it says, so she lights a lamp. Church, listen to me. I don't have much time here. We have the light of Christ that we're supposed to take into a dark world. And how can you find something in the dark if you don't have light to help you see? Can I say that again? How will we know? How, how can we find it? I mean, a, a lost coin in a dirt floor would, would just blend in. Unless the light is there to help you see. If we don't have the light of God, what good? How, how can we find them? How can we, we help them? And yet, many Christians, as Jesus would say, would take the holy light of God and hide it under a bushel. When it was built, light is built to, to get rid of darkness. And help us to see. So she lights the lamp. And, and look what it says there. Sweeps the house. When I was a kid, I, I, I didn't, my, my grandparents were gone before I came around. But I had an aunt, my, my mom's sister who loved me. And uh, I would spend time with her. And, and uh, so two, three weeks in the summer after baseball, I would go spend at her house. And she, would, she would let me be the man of the house. She never married. And uh, I was sweeping one day. And she said, boy, who taught you to sweep? And I'm like, it's not that hard. You know, you, you sweep. You see, what I was doing was I'd sweep a little here. And I'd sweep a little there. And now, don't y'all laugh too hard because I know that's how some of these men vacuum too. <laughs> right? Just get up what you can see. The rest is good. Just, that's not how you do it. Right? If you're going to do it right, you get the stuff out of the way. You don't go, how many of y'all go underneath the chair? When your wife's not watching or when your husband's not there and he pulls a newspaper down and looks over the top at it, then you, no, what you do is you move the stuff. If you're going to sweep the floor, you do it systematically, right? You do it right. It's not just hit and miss. You sweep the whole floor. If you're searching for something, she lights the lamp. I believe she got the broom out, and she wants to cover every inch of it. Lynn's the highlight of my sermon this morning. At our house, she's called the finder. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all got one of those at your house? I mean, I'll say, Lynn, where's it at? She said, it's in the drawer. I don't see it. It's in the drawer. I don't see it. And she'll go in there and she'll, it's right there, I told you. <laughs> it doesn't really matter where it is in the house. A couple weeks ago, I said, honey, where's the light, lighter fluid? I was out trying to do some charcoal. We were going to have some hamburgers. Can I get an amen? amen? That's right. Summertime hamburgers, it's all good. But I needed the lighter fluid. Now, if I go to the store to buy lighter fluid, she says, we got some at the house. <laughs> Honey, where is it? It's in the carport. I don't see it. <laughs> or I find the one that's empty. 
Who puts the empty charcoal fluid back? Throw it away, amen? About five minutes later, she comes out to the, where the grill's at, and she's got one in her hand. It was in a box somewhere. Wasn't it? It was on the shelf. I'm sorry. I want to speak the truth when I'm preaching God's Word. It was on the shelf. I don't know. I didn't see it. But she wasn't going to quit until she found it. How come we want people to come to us and say, hey, I'm lost. Can you help me? And how come we do it hit and miss? Well, I'll go look for somebody. I don't see any. Go to Walmart. They're all over that place. It's like termites. They're all in there. Watch them. You'll figure it out. Go to work. Go to the ball field. I praise God for the parents that are with their children at the ball field. But I tell you, some of the most ungodly behavior I've ever seen in my life is at the ball field. It's crazy. And I'm not talking about the kids. I'm talking about the parents. But get this, lost people act like lost people because they're lost. But some of them act like they're good people, but they're still lost. And you don't know. Until you talk to them, how are you going to know? Well, I just assume. Y'all ever been to a funeral where somebody just got up and said, now that person's going to hell. No, they're not going, they're there. <laughs> well, they they were such a good person. They brought me a cup of sugar one time when I needed to make some sweet tea, and they were just... I'm grateful that they brought you some sugar, but that's, that doesn't mean that they're going to make it to heaven. Now, I'm talking to you, and you know exactly what I'm talking about. But listen, church, there are people that we're walking by every day that don't know Christ, and we say that we care. And it's kind of like me when I'm looking for the one thing. I just don't see it because I'm not systematically doing it. I've got to have eyes to see. I've got to search. Look what it says in verse 8. She searched carefully until she found it. If you were the one that didn't know Christ, would the witness of this church find you where you are and bring you to a saving knowledge of Christ? <laughs> so many people want to say, well, that's the Lord's work. That's the Lord's work. This is the absolute picture of the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit works in, with, and through us. It may make you feel better to say that's someone else's job. Then why, when he saved you, did he not take you directly to heaven? He left you here to serve him. He left you here with the love of God to love people. To him. It's not hard to love someone. Just get yourself out of the way and put Christ in the way. And she didn't stop. She didn't stop because it meant something to her. She saw value there. I don't think she would have stopped until she found it. I'd have think she'd have swept that room and swept that room and swept that room and looked and she'd have burned one candle and two candles and ten candles. She would have done whatever it took to find what was lost. Praise God for that. But verse 9 says, when she found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together saying, rejoice, rejoice with me for I have found the peace of which I lost. Can you just picture this? Here's my glorified imagination. 
I think she's running out of the house. She's got it in her hand. She's up there doing this. I found it. I found it. And everybody's going to say, well, bless your heart. What would you find? <laughs> My coin. I didn't know you lost it. Yes, but I found it. Come over. We're going to celebrate. I'm just so happy. Can, can we celebrate together? I don't want to celebrate alone. I, I want you, you. I love you. Come, let's celebrate together. Isn't that fun? You don't want to be by yourself when you celebrate. Heaven's going to be a blast. <laughs> I'm going to see people like, you made it? Oh, man, I didn't think you had a chance. <laughs> Amen? Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now listen, it still takes that sinner coming to a personal relationship with God. You get saved one heart at a time. Nobody else can do it for you. But there is a Holy Spirit that's searching, that's wooing, that's not going to stop. And we're out there being the seed and hopefully being the harvest. We're scattering the seed. And, and it may be the first person that talks to that person. It may be the tenth person that talks to that person. You might find them when they're a child. You might find them when they're a senior adult. But when they repent and God gets up off the throne, dips his pen in the blood of Christ, writes their name down in the Lamb's Book of Life, the angels who see the value of it rejoice. Jesus, I'm so sad that you had to leave us and go down. Jesus, I'm so sad that you have scars on you that show the pain and the limit of your love. But Lord Jesus, I'm grateful that that one chose you. I'm grateful that that one had the wisdom to receive the great gift of glory and of heaven. I don't want anyone to go into eternity without Jesus. I don't want anyone to miss the joy of the Lord. I want everyone to have what my heart feels now, the peace and the love of God. They're all around us. We're here. Joy in the presence of the angels of God. We need to celebrate, church. We need to be about the Lord's business. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Today, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Lord loves you. He's done everything that is needful and necessary for your salvation. He knows every sin you've committed. You're not going to shock him. You're not going to surprise him. And there's nothing that you have done that he's not willing to forgive. He's willing to make you whole and perfect in him. He sees value in you, even when you don't see value in yourself. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He wants you to be in heaven with him. But love is a choice. He wants you not to have to. But he wants you to choose to. If you're here today and you're not 100%, 1,000% sure that Jesus is your Savior and Lord, that if you died today, that you would go to heaven. Forever's too long to be wrong, folks. 
Would you give your heart and life to Christ? Would you repent of your sins? Ask him to come into your life and save you? Do you feel the Holy Spirit's wooing? Do you feel the light of his love drawing you to himself? In your own words, tell Jesus right now, speak to him in prayer. Speak to him from your heart to God. Lord, I have sinned. And I'm sorry. I repent of my sins. I believe in you. I know that you came to earth to die for me. I believe you were buried, and I know that you rose again. I know that you're listening to my prayer. Lord, my life is broken. Save me. All my life I give to you. If you meant that, if you said it from your heart to God, he heard you. Matter of fact, if you said that prayer, the Bible tells us that the angels in glory are rejoicing even now. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to rejoice with you too.